Welcome to another episode of the Renegade Variety Hour. Today we are talking to Jeffrey Tucker, as you can all see. He's the former editorial vice president of the Mises Institute and present executive editor of Laissez Faire Books, author of It's a Jetson's World, and would you like me to tell? Would you like to say your other books? Bourbon well, for Breakfast, I believe, and A Beautiful Anarchy. That's it. Yeah. Okay. I mean, Which there's are, one other, but it's about music and totally irrelevant to this conversation. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, um, and all of those books are actually available for free, which is, yeah. as far as I know, correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, which is great because it's kind of the opposite of the whole intellectual property move, and it's good that you're actually taking it consistently. Right, that's right. So, and also, you know, I, I, the idea, too, is that, in fact, when I was recently at this conference in Houston, and somebody gave me a, a version of my a bourbon breakfast I had never seen before. So somebody actually took the text and republished it with a new cover and sold it on Amazon, which made me laugh. But, you know, it was really exciting. You know, so it's fun. How did you like the reproduction? Well, I, I thought it was fine. I mean, it, it's good. I mean, it, it rattled me at first, but I mean, you know, the thing about words and ideas is once they're spoken, once they're out there, they belong to all of humanity. And that's the goal. I mean, that's not something to regret. That's something that you want. You know, that's what we should all aspire to. So when I see stuff I've said sort of repackaged and 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 you know represented to the world, uh, to me that's great. It's a little like adding yeast, you know, or some leavening agent to something that would otherwise be dead. I mean, copyright, patent, intellectual property kills things. Yeah, and, and the, the rebranding thing or, or the rewording of things is kind of how we are able to get majority of all of our ideas. That's how ideas evolve is by borrowing a little bit and then trying to come up with something new based off of that information. Well, that, I think it's true, and people forget this. When an idea enters your head, okay, so like it comes in this way and then it comes out this way, it's going to be different. You know, there's no such thing as perfect repetition because we're human beings and we're rational. So we are all of us, every minute of the day, transforming ideas. We, we extract information from the world, we process it in our, through our own experiences and our own education and sense of things and understandings, and then we uh, uh, use it in a way that's completely different from the way it came into us. So, yeah. And that's the beautiful thing about ideas. They're malleable, you know. We're, we're, human beings are remixing agents, you know. It's, it's we're always producing derivative works, you know, and everything we do. Yeah, I think that's what creativity is all about. I mean, IP, in my opinion, most definitely limits individuals' abilities to be creative. Well, um, I mean, in a normal conversation with me and you, at no point will I go, um, you know, I was just thinking about how it would be great if we put cheese on bread. I'm going to go ahead and copyright that right now. Like, I need to patent this this idea. No, I, I'd rather just be able to present that idea to you and then for us to be able to come up with new ideas based off of that. It's kind of like, a, the, I guess the problem with IP is the fact that you're creating scarcity where there's not scarcity. Yeah, and it's not very successful. I mean, it's kind of based on a myth in a way because it's not. It's just simply not possible to freeze human minds in one place or to freeze society or, or to free, freeze the human project and say, okay, this is the configuration we want for the next, you know, seven years, 20 years, 170 years, whatever it's going to be. This is ridiculous. It doesn't actually work. So you, what you end up with IP is creating a bunch of lawbreakers, in effect, you know. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and I guess victimless crimes, they're not really lawbreakers. Well, they're breaking the law, but the laws are unjustifiable. <laughs> Completely. So. You know, it's interesting. It's interesting what's happening now because I, I I like to follow the music industry a lot, and I'm sure you've noticed this that there's doing covers is becoming more and more yeah, normal. Have you noticed this? Indie artists in particular. I think. Remix. Yeah. yeah, that's that's generally <laughs> whenever you hear any single uh, new song, there's a remix instantly. It's I don't. It's almost instant. Yeah, and it a uh, majority of the times what it is is for. Um, to take any kind of popular song and then make it more applicable for people who are doing ecstasy at the time. So let's put a strong <laughs> beat on the backdrop, um, yeah. which, you know, sounds really good whenever I guess you just, yeah, I love this. I need water, but I really am enjoying this. 
Yeah, no, this fire sign, there's one called Fire, the Inferno version done by, I, for, I forget now the, the names of, but anyway, yeah, you're right, it happens within days, and thank goodness for it, because you want, you want things improved, or maybe if, even if they're not improved, you want them reinterpreted. Yeah. You know, what's fascinating to me about what's happening right now in the arts, and I'm very excited about the arts, because we're seeing a kind of revival of an ancient tradition. Back in like the 17th century, 18th century, it was very common for composers to come up with melodies, which would typically be based on maybe folk songs or something they heard elsewhere. And they're presented in maybe an orchestral version. And then some guy would grab the melody and, and redo it into a choral version. And somebody else would grab the version and present it in a, maybe a minstrel context. Somebody else would take the same melody. And, and, and Orlando de Lasso, a great composer of the 16th century, was famous for taking kind of bawdy street songs that he heard in Paris and then going to Rome and composing them as masses and performing for the Pope. And when the Pope found out about this, he was a little unhappy. But nonetheless, this is the way things happen. Everything was remixed. This is how civilization was, was built. It, it continued up until the 19th century. Very common. Mahler would borrow the melodies of Brahms and put them in a minor key. I mean, this was the way things happened. Then suddenly in the 20th century, we saw for the first time the emergence of this weird thing called copyright, and there's a big crackdown. No taking from anybody else, no stealing anybody else's work. Everything you do has to be perfect and original and brand new, never done before. And what do you know, we got a lot of weird stuff coming out of you know, the serious music industry. Because it's, it's, it's unnatural, it's contrary to the way everything used to happen. So now, a century, you know, we blasted through the century of, of, of a lot of crappy music, with the exception of, you know, bebop and rock and, and these other kind of, uh, you, know, uh, you, know, uh, you know, not serious, uh, more, uh, you know, kind of earthy, uh, uh, like, and folk music in the 60s, more, more earthy and people-oriented music, which freely borrowed from each other. Now we're moving into the 21st century technology allowing us to kind of restore what is really a late medieval tradition, you know, of borrowing and improving and sharing. And it's a beautiful thing. I think it's why popular music has improved so much just in the last 10 years and why we're seeing a kind of a new renaissance in, in popular music and the arts and movies and everything. That's a very positive look towards popular music. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't know. Um... I, I guess it, I'm just trying to think of the music right now and then the music 10 years ago. Justin Bieber versus NSYNC. It's just kind of a... I guess Adele's nice. I like her. She's good. Well, you no, just, you know, Mises, Mises wrote a book in 1954 where he has a couple of passing comments about popular culture. And he, he talks about people who... Uh, you know, it's very easy to name people within popular culture you don't like. You're like, this seems tacky. You know, but he says that the beauty of the market is, is that it creates more of everything. So you get more bad stuff, but you also get more good stuff. Yeah. So it's all a matter of what you want to on and think about. Yeah, you, I think whenever you bring up places like Walmart and how people really hate on Walmart, right? Because there's a lot of, frankly, there's a lot of shitty stuff in, in Walmart, right? But at the same time, there's so much that's great. Yeah. There is. There's so much, and it's given to us at a really cheap price, and there's a tremendous amount of it. So in the end, it's like, what are you complaining about, you know? Yeah, and, and when, it, when it comes to music right now, to the, I mean, the fact that I can download any single thing I want right now on Pirate Bay is actually very beneficial because now I'm able to figure out all these different bands that I didn't know about. There was a, there was a playlist going on forever called, they do it every single month, it was called like Indie Playlist May. I'd find out about 100 new bands that I never knew of that could have never occurred if we were just running off of you know, normal terrestrial radio with that openness that we're getting through the internet, there are definitely definitely some, you know, new things coming out. I think I'm just too lazy to find out which ones are good and which ones are bad, honestly. Yeah. That's probably my fault more than any other any others. But have you noticed that it seems like even the big producers of television, movies, and music are starting to understand that piracy is not hurting them. It's probably actually helping them. You know, HBO made an announcement the other day that they didn't mind that was a Game of Thrones, which I don't watch, is a, being uh, uh, pirated. 
you know, all of really? it. Really? Watch yeah. it streaming, you know, so. That's uh, great. Yeah. That's good because we're, we're, I just downloaded it yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> so. We're out of I'm band. glad they're not mad. Are you fans? Are you both fans yes. of Game oh, of Thrones? Yeah. God. It's Are you so love it? Good. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. We're well, going to watch the newest episode right after this interview, actually. <laughs> we're just talking about that. <laughs> Well, the only thing I know about Game of Thrones I, I read on The Onion, which I probably shouldn't have. Uh, yeah, but but there are other things on HBO. Like, I like um, The Borgias, you know. I don't know. Oh, the, yeah, I'm addicted. I haven't yeah. watched it. You like The Borgias? I do. I love The Borgias. Actually, when you mentioned Rome in the background, you know, you see the Colosseum sort of falling apart at that time. And, uh, oh. yeah, The po- Borgia Pope was an, an interesting guy. <laughs> oh, Jeremy Irons, right? Yeah. <laughs> I oh. love the Borgias. Yeah, it really makes me. And another one I I really like of all the modern television shows is Boardwalk Empire. Yeah, I really like. And of course, who doesn't love Breaking Bad? Yeah, oh, we're all suckers. That is that, such a good right. show. <laughs> and it's amazing that you can make a show where no one is really that likable, but you really care what's going to happen next. You know, I love how all the shows that you mentioned have characters that are clearly breaking laws and breaking the rules. <laughs> Those are the shows that you fall in love with. Yeah, uh, of course. You know, and the reason is that the state is essentially the great artificial. I mean, what's real? What's real are the choices we make, the lives that we live, you know, the people we interact with, the voluntary exchanges we engage in, our mistakes, you know, our successes, our loves, our hatreds, you know, that's reality. And this thing called the state, it's just this big artificial contraption that's just kind of sitting on top of this beautiful reality below and going, we're in charge. We're in charge. Give us your money. You know, and, and you know, it's just, it's just this terrible nonsense. You know, it, it's not life. It's just artificial. And so, yeah, the great art, you know, just, you know, laughs at the state and dispenses with it, sort of sweeps it aside and says it's the great artificial, the great temporary, the, you know, the thing that's real is, is the emergence and building of civilization, the process that leads to, you know, greatness in society, you know, the errors, the successes, the, uh, you know, the trials and the errors, you know, that, that's the life, the drama of human life. It's found within the free market, within an economic context, and with, with exchange in, in the cultural context, and, and with capital accumulation that leads to ever more innovations, like we see, you know, the fact that you and the three of us are talking on this, you know, this wild postmodern contraption, you know, and we're acting like it's normal. You know, it's, it's like when the dreams come true, we think they're ho-hum. This is not ho-hum. This is a dream come true. You know, it really is. But anyway, the state had nothing to do with this. You know, so that's, I think that to me, this is the case for libertarianism, is basically to look at reality and go, this is who we are. This is what we are doing. This is what's possible. And the state is essentially irrelevant to it all. I guess, and it's also, if you, okay, so I got out of university, you know, rather recently, I had a liberal fine arts degree in sociology, so you can imagine, everybody there loved libertarianism and capitalism. A common complaint, though, was something like Walmart, you know, people would bring up that uh, Walmart was this terrible thing because they provided all these different services. Well, they didn't say it exactly like that, I'm creating a man made out of straw, but if you... If you looked at what they wanted, they wanted some great socialist empire, but would I wouldn't I mean none of them would ever want to go to the DMV. None of them would actually want to go to the post office. I can go to Walmart and I can get an oven, I can get tires, I can get cat food, I can get an avocado from Argentina, or I can get clothes that are made in China, yeah. you know, all these different great things, and then I can go to the DMV and I might get a license after three hours and I won't get a parking space. And it's not even anything you want, really. That's what's weird about the right. driver's license. Like, we'd be all happy to drive without it, right? Yeah. And Walmart actually gives us stuff we want. And if we don't like it, we can take it back. And they're like, oh, so sorry, sir. You know, how can we please you? You know, and you have to be a real son of a bitch, you know, to, to finally get them to kick you out, you know, at Walmart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's th- th- think... tyrannical and insane, almost. I mean, yeah. you see the website, People of Walmart, and you can go in however you want. <laughs> You know, it's not like there's no dress code and you can be almost insane as long as you're not I, being I, a lunatic. I, I recall both of us, like, early on in college, around 18 or 19, we would just go into Walmart and play football. Like, 3 <laughs> o'clock in the morning, and no one would care. They might just give you, like, a, really? And like, I'm sorry, man. Uh, here, let me buy some crack- crackers or something. But, you know, if you go to a DMV and you act 
at all imposing to their authority, right. um, then they can just you know they can just throw you in prison. Right. But when you go into a, to, let's say a McDonald's where they think of you as fifty eight thousand dollars rather than the one burger that they're going to buy from you because they realize how much money they can make off of you, they'll give you a refund. They'll be really nice to you because you don't you're not obligated to give them money. They know you're giving it to them out of choice, and because of that, they don't treat you like shit. You know, that's the whole key. Uh, you know, it's, the, it's marketing. It's who's in charge, right? Is it the consumer or is it the rulers? The people with the guns or the people with the, with with who are spending their money voluntarily? It's such a beautiful thing, isn't it, to experience that contrast between the DMV and, and McDonald's. And to me, it's like going from hell to utopia, you know? It used to bother me very much, y'all, that, um, that there's so many, like, people who complain about Walmart and and McDonald's and, you know, the market, and they're sort of whining and bitchy all the time. But yeah. I kind of realized something, too, the other day. I was thinking about this. Like, it used to really upset me, and I feel like I have to come to the defense of Walmart, and I, I've always wanted to, like, put, a, a like, a, a yard sign in front of my house, you know, praising McDonald's <laughs> or something. Or where I, I actually have been looking for years for a McDonald's bow tie, but I can't seem to find one. Like, they don't even make with them. I, I don't understand that, but... Um, when voting season comes around, I think I heard you mention that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll vote for Wal I'll, I vote for Walmart. Yeah, right. of, uh... well, this, is, this is what I vote for every day. So you know, but you know the thing is that they're so popular, and we know they're popular because they're expanding and they're all over the world. That shows that people are willing to use their own personal property to vote for these institutions and say, I like what you have to sell, and I think it'll improve my life. So I'm willing to engage in this mutually beneficial exchange with you. You win, I win. We both give each other gifts. We're both better off. It's, it's Christmas every minute you know, at McDonald's because there's this relentless uh, benefaction you know, going on. So, yeah, I mean, it's global. And it's beautiful. So given how big it is, there's always going to be a small number of people that are going to whine and complain about it. So I've stopped being so upset about it because I always figure there's going to be a few people out there that are just going to be the, you know, the trolls of the world, you know, and we'll just let them, let them be. The point is McDonald's expands, Walmart expands because people love them, because they're serving humanity. And it's not just those two institutions. Those are only the most popular. It's every Success in a market represents humanity better, made better off. I mean, it's it's the human spirit being elevated, it's the heart being lifted, it's human beings being served in exactly the way that all the great philosophers ever imagined from the ancient world. We're achieving that right now in our times through the free market itself. The free market is utopia. It's the great benefactor to humanity. It's the best social service network that has ever been imagined and it's all around us that's why we should love it you know um for a while um i was kind of anti fast food or anti um mcdonald's or something along those lines because i went ahead and i you know i watched food inc and i was and a lot of the ways that they do treat animals is atrocious and a lot of that has to do with the fact that they subsidize that's true certain parts of agriculture which is bad we know we know that for a fact now um, but it was also because they made food and tailored it by scientists to make it, you know, f to be able to hit every single signal, every single op opiate and everything else in her head. And I was like, well, that's terrible that they're doing that. And then Penn Jillette mentioned on an episode of Bullshit where he goes, oh, so you mean they're giving them what they want and making them happy and giving them lots of food for a cheap price? I was like, oh, yeah, I'm an asshole. Okay, I <laughs> see I'm the loser here. <laughs> Also, the best part about the free market is that if you don't like that institution, you don't have to go. You can go elsewhere and eat something else. Yeah, that's um, exactly right. And that's, that's the beauty. It's human choice. And everybody has different views on these kinds of things. And I want to live in a world of maximum human choice where every individual can achieve whatever he or she really wants, you know, through, through peaceful means. And, and that is a world of liberty. I mean, that is a world to me that's a world without the state because the state does nothing but inhibit this capacity to choose and to live out our dreams you know and and to me isn't it true that that's all the state is really us anymore i mean people don't really regard politics as much to help at all to the of human life do you think i think most people are pretty indifferent to politics <laughs> well i don't know uh, congress has a six percent like 
approval rating. Approval rate, yeah. Man, imagine if, I don't know, if you just think about the return on investment. If a CEO went into a company and every single thing that he stated, like we're going to get a 100% return, we're going to get, you know, all these wonderful things, he gets in and he does none of those. He actually makes everything worse. Yeah. Um, and you don't hear people go, well, that's just the way CEOs are. You know, right. you, you don't, you don't, you, they get fired and then you replace them with someone who can actually do the damn job. But now people actually already know that politicians are going to lie to you. They're already well aware of that fact. Right. Um, well, this is the great flaw of democracy is that we yeah. have to vote for people instead of issues. I mean, it kind of maybe you've noticed this at the state level that sometimes there are on the ballot are particular issues like do you favor this tax increase or do you favor this bond, you know, uh, uh, deal, whatever. And you feel more comfortable voting for or against particular things like that, particular policies. And then on the other part of the ballot, you have to vote for people like Joe or Dan, you know, Michelle or Mary, you know, and you're like, who are these people? You know, and so what what they told me, you know, at the rally I went to or so what what they promised. I mean, once they're elected, politicians can do whatever they want. It was a great flaw of democracy, actually, as we're currently conceiving it, that we vote for human beings to rule us rather than principles that are going to you know, govern our lives. Yeah. Here, just keep. I I'll be yeah. back in one second. Yeah. I just gotta do something. Okay. <laughs> no, you're right. We end up voting for people to govern us instead of governing ourselves. Yeah. No, that's right. Um, and this is this is a terrible flaw, and we end up having to sort of trust these people to make sure that um, you know they're going to carry out our wishes and they never do. And we keep being disappointed, like, oh, my God, you know, why did, you know, uh, uh, John Smith not, uh, you know, uphold the principles I believe in? Well, uh, you know, well, maybe because he's a fallible human being and um, he sees politics as his career and he has no real incentive or interest in fulfilling the desires of, you know, that, uh, that, that you have. Unlike McDonald's, right? When you order fish McBites, they're going to give you fish McBites. But you order low taxes from Congressman Joe Blow, and he goes and raises raises the taxes. There's no mechanism that allows you to like return him. You know, I'd like to return my politician, please. He didn't turn away. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Well, it, it's it's also none of the logic that we take uh, for granted when it comes to say businesses or individuals. Uh, do we apply that to? these politicians who we, we hold in some kind of like uh, religious dogmatic sense because if any single company was say $17 trillion in debt, you wouldn't have people going, oh, we should just not pay attention to the debt. Let's go start another, let's go buy another, I don't know, 100,000 houses. Um, right. you, you wouldn't do that. I mean, I'm, and I know like the average American is a couple thousand dollars in debt or maybe 10 or $20,000 in debt, but it's nothing, nothing on any level that the kind of debt that it, that the United States government or governments in general kind of based off of um, it, you wouldn't you wouldn't kind of hold to that same logic which makes me think mentally moving beyond the state is kind of the next hope as far as being able to get get across this and I think yeah. the internet is kind of allowing for that uh, evolution of mental thought because I do not see Many people on somewhere like Reddit or a number of these other kind of forums, they might justify the state in some kind of way. They might justify Obama in some kind of way, say, oh, well, it's Bush's fault. It was Clinton's fault, and that's why he's screwed right now. But there, it seems – it doesn't seem the kind of oorah, I guess, that people maybe had, you know uh, – in, in prior presidencies or in, yeah, in prior... Um, the falling. The faith is falling. Yeah. I've been very excited over the last week to see the rise of, of Bitcoin, you know, because, yeah. you know, this is an extraordinary thing. It's been wild. It's been a wild day in the Bitcoin world. We went from 148 down to 115, and uh, at the last I checked, we were back up to, like, 134, 135. Yeah, I, I just checked it, actually. It's 137 see, now. We're all obsessed, <laughs> right? <laughs> I wish I was obsessed because I wish I actually put money in it whenever it was a little bit lower. Like three years ago, I think it was at 14 cents. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Whoever put money in there then. There's a real problem well. here. So I now have to check, you know, like I wake up in the middle of the night with Bitcoin. You know, <laughs> people say, well, that's, that's the sign of a bubble. Well, maybe so. Yeah, it's 133. Okay. So, but what's cool about this is that 
I mean, it holds out the possibility of reinventing the world of monetary and financial uh, systems, which are controlled the w whole world over by governments and their crappy little paper money systems, you know? And if we can reinvent it through pure human choice so that it's rooted in sound money, you know, and actual ownership and property rights, and we can do this without changing anything about politics, just through our own choices, imagine the revolution that we can achieve. It could be you know, I want, amazing. I wanted to, to ask you actually about the Bitcoin. You mentioned a bubble. Would a bubble be possible with something like Bitcoin, though, if there's not, yeah. if, I mean, there's not an artificial duplication of, of the... No, the I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think a bubble is possible. Speculative, speculative frenzies are certainly possible in any area of human life, right? But uh, a bubble requires credit instruments, you know, like real estate, you know, uh, you know like Freddie Mae and Fannie Mac. And, and um, you know, even Tulip Mania saw an influx of money, you know, an unstable currency regime and things like John Law's scheme required a kind of, um, you know, a sole corporation, not a peer-to-peer -peer open source uh, format. So it seems to me... I think my way around how Bitcoin could actually be vulnerable to bubbles. If it, if it is, I can't figure out how it would be because we're talking about a peer-to-peer -peer network, open source, absolute strict ownership rights, clear identification between the unit and the owner. Um, you can watch it transaction by transactions. There's absolutely no credit instruments, no fractional reserves, no banks or warehousing or anything else. It's just so perfect. I mean, if it's not perfect, the market will discover a better one, but it seems pretty darn close to perfect. For right. What do, you, what do you think about in regards to the limitation of Bitcoin, which I think is great, you know, but there's, I think, what is it, 21 million? Yeah, 21 Bitcoins? million. It's, it's technically not a problem because you can just sort of keep going back by digit by digit and rename them, you know, the Fred, the Jim, the Martha, whatever. Um, so any current, any supply of money is suitable for any purpose. The only problem with Bitcoin right now is that the current infrastructure, the current um, software infrastructure that's supporting it is too thin and too weak to accommodate the current demand. So if you try to go online right now and, and buy, you're probably going to have problems. You probably won't be able to, and you probably have to you know, get up here 10 minutes in the middle of the night just to wait for them to be free because all the major exchanges have throttled the allocation of the initial allocate, allocation of new coins being created, or when they come online, they're being throttled. You can't get more than, I mean, I think Coinbase limits you to 10, and even then it's a problem. So, but that's a software infrastructure problem. That's a temporary glitch. I mean, and it, it is a real problem, but we're going to see this change over time. And by the way, I thought it was interesting that the throttling was most intense today when the price began to fall. What that meant is that buyers, new buyers, were simply not able to get through. So I see a tremendous upside potential here once the software infrastructure becomes more robust. And we forget that Bitcoin is basically, you know, all the big exchanges are run just by full of geeks who used to be like World of Warcraft players, you know, like a few years yeah. ago. <laughs> I mean, you know, we're not, not going to yeah. open sacks here, you know. So we're, we're at the very beginnings of, of a new industry. But I'm sure, you know, someone like Krugman would go ahead and deny that it's going to be at all important, which is what he did in the 1990s when he said the fax, the Internet will only be as good as the fax machine when it comes to economic movement. That's pretty silly. How the hell does he have a job? Yeah. <laughs> what? That's an interesting question you could ask about a lot of people, yeah. <laughs> what was funny to me about Krugman's comments about Bitcoin in particular is he said, look, this is not what a money is supposed to do. A money is not supposed to grow in value because that only gives people the incentive to save it. Uh, the purpose of a money is to circulate and kind of, you know, fuel economic activity. So it gets in your hands and you release it and you consume, you consume, you consume. Um, he has a circular flow Keynesian view, and to him, Bitcoin is like the ultimate nightmare. Yeah, because it can't be cooled down, right? Yeah. It can't be controlled, and there's that sense of anxiety that you get out of not having, I guess, a central planner. Um, yeah. And also, you know, it's rising in value, so you have the incentive to save it. I mean, to, in Paul Krugman's world, that's a disaster, but savings is the basis of capital formation, investment, and, you know, the building of a robust society. I mean, we've been depleting our capital for, you know, 50 to 100 years. Bitcoin actually is the hope that we're going to be able to rebuild, you know, this capital instead of depleting it.
you know. And Krugman's world, we just deplete and deplete until we're dead. Because in the long run, who cares? I mean, that's Krugman's view. Bitcoin actually holds out the possibility that we're going to start building up something wonderful again. And it, that's why it's a, a source of hope. I think so. So rather than the uh, the kind of dystopic Alex Jones version of the world where yeah. all our currency just falls and then I'm attacking her with a spear in order to be able to get ravioli, um, we'll be able to do kind of a natural change possible where That's people are good. even if you don't even go to Bitcoin, you can go to say silver or gold where you know it's at least you have the feeling that throughout all of humanity that's kind of gone up yeah, no, I'm, or, or it's, it's kept its worth. Yeah, I, look, human beings are not going to be defeated. You know, we're not going to just sit back and go, well, I guess the bad guys are in charge and they hate my guts, I'll just die now. I mean, that's just not the way human beings are. You know, we find workarounds, we find ways to live, we find ways to thrive. We're very creative and we're more creative than states. That's why I think when we're going to win this struggle. Yeah, I just want to mention uh, the article that you wrote, Bitcoin for Beginners, was fantastic, by the way. Anyone who's listening right now and hasn't read it, please do. Um, it gives a lot of insight as to what's going on with Bitcoin, and it gives a pretty thorough explanation. Yeah, I, I, I studied up on it really quickly. I mean, I got <laughs> attached to Bitcoin. I sold my first bow tie for Bitcoin. That was it. Yeah, <laughs> and your ATM experience sounded fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> and then a pair of, of, of crimping pliers, you know. I should drag, drag them out of the closet and show them. To me. Anyway, this is my, my great sacred treasure, you know, my first Bitcoin purchase. And now I'm not spending my Bitcoin. I'm just holding on to it and checking it yeah. Yeah. like all over. Yeah, that, 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 uh, that purchase is going to be worth a lot more money later. So actually saving it seems like a good idea. <laughs> Sell it on eBay, huh? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So what are your ideas on, I've read that some people, particularly in France, are requesting their salaries be paid to them in Bitcoin. That is such a cool thing. In fact, uh, just today, my company offered to pay me in Bitcoin. I said, please, let's go for it. You know, then they backed away from it. They were just testing me to see how serious I was yeah. about this. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty funny. Well, yeah, and they, they're not exactly sure exactly how much, you know, to give you right now, because, I mean, the stability of it isn't. I mean, it, w it would have to be modified because, I mean, the, the, the idea of kind of the normal salary that, you know, $40,000 a year or whatever, it, with the way Bitcoin is going up in value so quickly, you would, it'd be kind of hard to be able to tell you, hard. okay, I'm going to, I'm going to give you 15 Bitcoin a week or yeah, something. Yeah, that would be know? difficult to make contracts in that sense. I mean, we're in the transition stage. There's a big dispute about whether it's money now or not. Um, I don't really know what to say to that. I mean, it seems like an argument about definitions. I mean, we're seeing an emerging kind of money, really, and we're in that in-between stage, you know. I think, yeah, the best way you described it was that it's in beta form, yeah. you know. Let's be honest, it's in beta well, form. Well, that's... Well, and it's, mm -hmm. is, is it the idea is because it's not a currency because it's not based off of a commodity? No, no. The, the, the question is whether or not our independently denominated, you know, in Bitcoin in a way that's stable and psychologically ascertainable by people over time. I, I'm not setting that up as a principle, but I'm just positing that as a potential so, problem. So once it's old enough, then people will be okay with it? Yeah, Is that kind of once thing? you adapt to it and you begin to think of things in terms of Bitcoins, but it's interesting to me because if I've spent enough Bitcoins and I've dealt with them enough in the course of the day, I do tend to think in terms of Bitcoins, you know? So I think we're ex alive right now at a very exciting times because we're it's the first time in human history we've been able to live through the emergence of a new money in real time like this, you know, and to really watch it go from nothing to a substantial part of, you know, human exchange. So it's kind of a, a fascinating experiment to... What do you... Uh, you know, we were talking about evolving past the state, though. Do you think um, that the, the evolution of, of the mind through... The beauty of, uh, of digital communication is one thing, uh, but in order to move past the state, do you think a parenting change has to occur as well? The, basically, the way that people are raising their children. Yeah, I'm, look, I, you know, when Stefan Molyneux, who's I'm very interested in his thinking on this, first posited these ideas, I just kind of, well, I wasn't too warm to them because I thought it sounded a little bit crazy. But the more I listen to them, the more I realize that there there is a strange, you know, the problem with the state is not just that it's the state. The problem is that it represents power, 
I mean, the ultimate form of power. Well, the parent-child relationship can also similarly mimic this kind of relationship in a bad way. You know, the parent has a tremendous amount of responsibility and a bad parent can have a tremendous amount of power that can, you know, have a terrible effect on a child. So I, I would appreciate his contribution in this sense because he's drawing attention to this. Like if, if we believe in volunteerism, if we believe in exchange and we believe in humanitarianism and cooperation, when we think that's a better system than imposition and coercion and power relationships, then that should have an effect in our family lives too. It was interesting when um, we, we got to meet Liberty at the Pines, which was, you know, mind blowing to be able to meet you and Steph there. But I asked Walter Block a question. He was, we, we were talking through Skype, which was, um, can you take the non-aggression principle consistently uh, if you don't apply it to children? And of course, at first he's like, well, of course I apply it to them. And then I asked, well, is it okay um, uh, to, to, to get into a, uh, a violent dispute with your children if you're going to get into that, that kind of arrangement? Um, and he basically justified spanking by making a lot of really intense conceptual arguments that didn't seem very consistent but i mean i guess i'm already coming off as i have a certain bias well, of course. In regards look to this. I, I love walter um so but i i am pretty sure i disagree with him you know on that on that point well it's not so much that i disagree with him but i think he dismisses it too quickly you know yeah um i think there's a kind of libertarianism out there that is maniacally focused on one thing and that is the state and the state only. As if there's no other problems in life. As if we're not talking about a broad ethic, but just one thing. It's like, once we get rid of the state, then everything will be great, and there's no problem in the world except the state. And I just, I've come to a conclusion that that's not quite right. I mean, the state is the embodiment of everything that's evil in the world, but that evil takes other forms. And right. um, I, not sure that Walter's thinking along those lines yet. Um, and I would like to see, I would think it's from a kind of a generation that tended to rightly identify the state as a unique evil, but I, but uh, there's more to it than that, I would say. Can I ask you one last quick question? What's um, your most, the most recent technological device that you find is so fantastic right now? I, well, of course, I mean, you wouldn't be surprised to hear this, but I'm intrigued by 3D printing, right? I mean, look, the whole world today, you know, it's like things are becoming available that are so interesting. None of us have time enough to explore, you know, all the marvels that are around us. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm very intrigued. There's a new book out called Makers that's about 3D printing. And I'm very interested in, in reading it and find out more about it because this could change the world. I mean, could, the elimination of shipping, the, the migration that we've seen of the physical world to the digital world is going to take a new, different form in the future so that physical objects themselves become recreatable, you know, in the digital space. This is entering into a totally new realm, the possibility of reinventing our reality on, based on the absence of scarcity. And that's pretty pretty outrageous and exciting. Yeah. Um, okay, so I know you, you need to, to start getting out of here soon. Um, so is uh, your website is Laissez Faire Books, and yeah. they, people can find yeah, you now? Yeah, it's Laissez Faire Books is lfb.org, and okay. um, we run the Laissez Faire Club, which is a kind of a cool club. We're distributing more and more stuff. We, started with just books now we're doing reports summaries and special things and we've got a new bitcoin report coming out soon if you want a free trial you can go to lfb.org slash free trial and you can just download everything and have fun uh it's kind of a cool group and we're we meet once a week in a, in a google chat and talk about the the newest idea and the newest things happening the world's on fast forward so it's good to have friends and colleagues and that's the purpose of the club Great. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Tucker. Yeah, it was it was a it was very much an honor to have well, you on our show. So I I hope we get to talk again soon. Please, I hope so. Please call me back and let's visit again soon. Definitely. Right, great. Bye bye. Bye.